and say welcome to the Knoxville College talk about COVID-19. Uh, we've called this uh, the Black Effect. Uh, as an HBCU, we're looking at how does COVID-19 affect our community? How is it affecting the state of our HBCUs, the state of the Black community from an economic standpoint, an educational standpoint, a public health standpoint, and also from a human services standpoint. And so tonight, um, we're gonna have this small uh, round table fireside chat. Um, I have Dr. Ebony Bowers with me, and uh, she is currently a, uh, the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Knoxville College. And this is gonna be a very interesting talk. And all of the participants that we're gonna have, you know, are uh, uh, experts in their field. And, uh, and so we're just gonna have a little chat tonight about how has the COVID blackout effect been in you know, our community for getting started? So I'm gonna roll it over to Dr. Bowers and then we'll uh, throw some questions out there. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name, as uh, Dr. Lindsay said, is uh, Dr. Ebony Bowers and I am a specialist in the human service field. Um, human services is similar to social work, but it's on a much broader scale. And um, I, I'm just ready to talk about this because it's very important, of course, working as the VP of Academic Affairs for Knoxville College and seeing it from that point of view and also actually being out in the field and also working with the students. This is very important, especially as minorities. So when we look at, you know, social work on a broader scale, you know, where you live in, in your community, how do you see the effect, you know, of the coronavirus when it comes to, to services? I see a reflection of what's going on nationally. Um, I, I don't see too many of us going for treatment if we do happen to have it. Uh, but I do see a lot of us social distancing, wearing masks, not attending um, events that have large crowds, because a lot of our churches still are on hiatus and are doing the online service, mm -hmm. if they're even doing that. Some are just waiting until later in the year to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know, and I found it to be very interesting because you know you're looking at unemployment benefits, people who are needing food benefits. You know, right. we have our homeless population. How do we tackle all of these issues on top of the coronavirus? You know, especially for people of color, how has this been such a blackout effect? Wow. Uh, those issues, you'll have to have several different uh, <laughs> talks about that. <laughs> because there is no way to address each one of those. But I know in this community, of course, with people that have lost their jobs and either the jobs reopened and had to shut down again because of having the corona exposure or the jobs just haven't opened up. So they were depending on the benefits that you know the government had the extended benefits for what six hundred dollars mm -hmm. but now since they have cut that and hadn't even really come up with a, another real plan now i've heard of people actually only having coverage of maybe sixty three dollars uh, sixty three dollars is not going to cover paying your rent or paying to get any medication if you happen to be sick or have a family member that needs it. That is not going to do anything. So on top of already not having health insurance because you either lost it because your job is completely gone. Um, I mean, all of these different elements. And on top of that, now we also have the kids going back to school. So then we have another concern of, do we send our children back to school or do we keep them at home? And if we keep them at home, currently in our district, the kids that are in elementary school do not have their own laptops provided by the district. Mm -hmm. So the parents would have to provide the laptops 
or the computers for the young people to get their education through. And that is only if they have the internet connection because certain areas within our district don't have internet service. Well, you know, and that was something that we even faced in this community. And, and this is probably mirroring a lot of communities across the United States is you're having them in this virtual environment, but they have to pay for computers, pay for right. the internet service, pay mm -hmm. for, uh, even if it's a basic service, but it's gonna require some form of money. Mm -hmm. Now, from, a, from that type of human services oh. standpoint, you know, what should our communities be focused on if this is going to be kind of how would we call our new normal, you know, for, for the immediate future? Well, as a human service professional and anybody that works within the field, I really think that education of the parents and guardians are very important because we still have some that, first of all, aren't aware they have an option. I've heard from several parents that are convinced that because the school district said it's okay, then they can just do that. I'm like, but did you hear there's also another option? Our school district gave us an option. You can either do vir virtual or they're going to do like trial for a month where it's an AABB schedule where the kids could go Monday, Tuesday, and then have virtual the rest of the week. Or they would be on Wednesday, Thursday, and have virtual the other days. So they're gonna run that test for a month. Then after that month, they're gonna kind of reevaluate. If things go well, mm -hmm. they're gonna go to five days a week. If they don't go well, they're probably gonna keep that same AABB schedule until they see things kind of slack up as far as the number of cases in the community. So I think educating the parents on what their options are, are very important. Also connecting them with different organizations that possibly have laptops to donate or even somebody within the community. They may have an old laptop that is still functional that you can just erase the hard drive and just let the children use because they will have the laptops from the district in October is what they told us. Mm -hmm. But they're still going to need something for the end of August until whenever they come in in October. So, so but then that leads me to ask this question. You mm -hmm. know, is it becoming a social service nightmare because <laughs> oh, of the yeah. lack of adequate resources <laughs> mm -hmm. for the people? Oh, yeah. Oh, most definitely. I, I mean, there's not enough food stamps for those families that need it. There are not enough um, hot spots for the families that do not have access to the internet. There, it just, the list of things go on and on. There's not enough um, child care for parents that have to go back to work, and they're already working several different jobs to try to make ends meet. It is just too much to really think about and process all at once on top of trying to protect yourself from this virus. It's just a lot. And of course, being in human services and social work, we're normally the first ones to get cut from the budget anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so we always have to come up with creative ways to make things work because Just take the money. <laughs> right? We're gonna move that money over here because <laughs> this needs it more than helping everybody else. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a real answer. I think we as human service providers need to get together and come up with at least some suggestions to see if we kind of pull our organizations that are still running and still functional at this time mm -hmm. and seeing what they can provide to help. Mm -hmm. Because we already know the food banks are being just overrun with people that need the additional food. And especially since they're cutting the food stamps. So from a national viewpoint, if we can just open and look at this from a national level, what three things do you think would be most important 
you know, from a, a, a human services uh, viewpoint? Ooh. That's well, a, that's one a good thing. Well, let's say one good thing. What's one good I, thing? You know, I have to look at um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, um, you know, it, it starts off, you know, with what you need, your basics with your, you know, your food, your shelter, and your safety. Um, I, I guess the most important thing nationally is, I think that's healthcare. Um, and that's not only for the coronavirus, but it's with all the other pre-existing conditions that we as minorities have to face that that is our thing high blood pressure mm -hmm. <laughs> put down the fried chicken um, people put it down <laughs> bake it grill it chicken, stop frying right. it put that crisco down <laughs> right you know um it, you know just obesity in general you know um because soul food you know we we put that extra that extra butter and grease and all the rest of that goodness in it. Um, Put the butter down. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So. But definitely healthcare. And I think mm -hmm. the pandemic as a whole just really compounded that and really brought that more to the fro forefront because healthcare was already an issue with minorities. Mm -hmm. It already was because we are normally under undercover we normally either don't have coverage at all or we have bare minimal so that that definitely i think that is definitely number one well and i'll give you a 1a and i think 1a is a plan you know what is the plan that we have for these resources and especially for people of color because for us who are by percentage you know dependent you know, a lot on these social services. You know, mm -hmm. what happens when we have to realize that that social service may not always be there for us in the way that we want it to be? Right. That, uh, that uber dependence, you know, on mm -hmm. the service. But that means there have to be programs out there to get people off of this system, to break them from these cycles. Because right. If not, it just simply becomes a generational move. Parents right. emulate the kids, kids mm -hmm. emulate the parents, and it just goes on and on and on. And right. So I'm really wondering, you know, what is that future, you know, for, you know, social services in the United States? And, mm -hmm. and nothing beats a good disease to figure out what you're not good at. Oh, yes. And so I think it's bringing out some lessons, you know, on the holes that we have in our social service system. You know, that net that we think is wide is a wide net with right. a lot of holes. Mm -hmm. Because we still have people falling through those cracks, you know, exactly. with this. And so mm -hmm. for me, you know, as a, a biologist and a health person and a, and a financial person, you know, that social services side is totally, it's its not foreign, but it's a different language. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's totally a different language that they speak, you know, right. that I don't know. You know, most of my tidbits is what you read in the newspaper or what you talk to someone about. But as we kind of wrap this up, you know, what is the message? You know, if there was one good thing that we wanted to leave people to be encouraged with, because we're not going to leave you on the gloom and doom note. Oh, you know, no. we want you to be encouraged. And so if there was something that we can leave with them to empower and encourage someone who's listening so that this blackout effect is not a, a total eclipse, it's just a partial one. You know, it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. But what can we leave them? Um, if you have any extra food, whether it be canned or if you have a garden, because a lot of people have started with their gardens. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if that wasn't a practice of theirs before, I've noticed a whole lot more people have started to garden. And I, I think we have to go back to just helping our neighbors, 
just simply, um, I have a, a several neighbors that are older and, you know, we have some extra squash. Here you go. You know, if, if somebody comes by and they're like, hey, that looks really good in your garden. Well, hey, you want some? Here you go. You know, we have to be more generous and watch out for each other. Because, again, I, I don't know anybody's situation. And, you know, just just be generous with what you have. And if you happen to see somebody, you know, a single mother struggling and she has multiple kids and she's already said she's going to have to do virtual you know, if you have an extra laptop or something, I said, just wipe the memory, just, you know, just kind of gift it to them. I mean, this is, if nothing else, this is the time for us to come together. Even though we can't be together physically a lot of times, mm -hmm. we can still come together. And those are ways that we can do it. Absolutely. And so Dr. Bauer, thank you for that insight, you know, on, on that human services side. And I think it's going to be important. And this is, you know, step one, you know, and, and this is the first part of a lot of series that we're going to bring. And we're planning to hit that education talk. We're going to talk about the economics. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that health picture. You know, it is truly a blackout effect. And we're really going to look for those solutions. So I'm thankful to, to you for, you know, sharing your insight and knowledge and, and expertise for a few moments you know, today, and I'm just uh, grateful for, for having you on. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.